Welcome to the John DeVito Show. It is a cold day in New England. It's 5.30 in the afternoon on Saturday, and we're going to have a special show for you tonight. We are going to be doing a one-on-one interview with Linda Wojcic. That's right. Linda Wojcic is the mother of Pamela Wojcic Smart, and I know that we've done some shows on the Pamela Smart case in the past. So we're going to be doing a one-on-one interview with Linda tonight because there have been new developments in the Pamela Smart murder case, which was, again, a huge case in the state of New Hampshire and all across the country many years ago when this whole thing went down. So a lot of you are familiar with what happened in the case, and we will also be telling you some new information today that has come up that we think is very relevant to deciding whether Pamela Smart should get a new trial in the state of New Hampshire. So anyway, my name is John DeVito. It is Saturday night, or I should say afternoon, 5.30. It's already dark here in New England, which is, you know, that time of the year that I hate. I don't like it being dark so early, but it is what it is. That's life in New England. Pretty soon we're going to have snow on the ground and doing all that good stuff. Hey, Eric, welcome to the show. Welcome to everybody coming in. Thank you for being here. All right, so for those of you, and I'm off the chat screen right now, so bear with me. Eric will be reading the chats that come in while I'm reading this. Uh, this information. But uh, for those of you not familiar with the Pamela Smart murder case, uh, Pamela Smart is in prison for life. She is now uh, 53 years old. She's a couple of months older than I am. She was born in New Hampshire, grew up in Miami, Florida, and ended up moving back to New Hampshire when she was in the eighth grade. So Pamela Smart grew up in New Hampshire. She was your typical, you know, child. She was a cheerleader in high school. She ended up going to Florida for college, went to Florida State, and she ended up coming home and meeting her future husband, Greg Smart, um, at a party, you know, at one time when she came back from Florida. So the two of them actually shared a passion for heavy heavy metal music, and they developed a, a good dating relationship. They ended up moving into marriage, so they got married. And then, you know, seven months after they had got married. Now, keep in mind, they were very young. Pamela was, I believe, 22 years old, and uh, she was a young woman. Greg was a young man. Seven months into their young marriage, um, Greg ended up cheating on Pam. So this was something, as her mother has described to me many, many times, was absolutely heartbreaking for her. It was something that crushed her personally. And at the time, she had been working at the local school district in a program that was associated with like a a local drug, drug awareness program. And she was like a media specialist. So Pam was never a teacher at Winter County High School, but she did work at this high school. And she ended up meeting a young man who was a sophomore in high school and his name uh, was Billy Flynn and still is Billy Flynn. So Pamela ended up meeting Billy at a very vulnerable point in her life where her husband had just cheated on her. She was young. She was just seven months into her first marriage and you know, was, it was at a very difficult point in her life. So she met this young man who you'll hear about later was portrayed as being a very innocent young man, a young man that, uh, you know, Pamela manipulated into doing whatever she wanted. You know, they eventually coined Pamela as the Black Widow, that she used her sexual charm and her power over Bill to manipulate him into killing her husband. Some of the things that you'll never hear about Billy Flynn, unless you dig deep, is, you know, Billy Flynn was a criminal at the age of 15 and 16 years old. Billy Flynn was a drug addict. Billy Flynn was into a lot of trouble. And, you know, they had kind of made it seem in the um, trial that Billy Flynn was, you know, kind of taken advantage of again by Pamela sexually. And he was very inexperienced, which, in fact, was not true. Billy Flynn was actually dating another older woman at the same time he was uh, seducing Pam Smart. I think a lot of people looked at this as being Pam Smart was the older black widow woman who was seducing Billy Flynn. But if you really look at it, I mean, Pam Smart was 22 years old. Billy Flynn was 15 and turned 16 during their relationship. It was not much of an age difference. And again, I get that it was wrong. I am not making any excuses for what she did. And she has never made an excuse for what she did. She has always admitted that having the relationship with Billy Flynn was one of the biggest mistakes she had ever made in her life. So she has admitted it from day one 
that having that affair was a huge mistake, that it affected the trajectory of her life. And she has even come out and said that she accepts responsibility indirectly for the murder, because if she had not had the relationship with Billy Flynn, then her husband, Greg, would still be alive today. So again, for those of you that are not too familiar with the magnitude of this case. Now, this happened, uh, I think it was around 1990, 1991. So this happened a while ago. Now, this was before we had all the different avenues of social media, all the different platforms we have right now, and everything that is you know going on. So, you know, back in the day, this was the biggest media circus case that the world had ever seen. So this was, you know, a beautiful young teacher was caught seducing a student, and this was the narrative, and she convinced this student to murder her husband, and it was almost like a made-for-TV movie. So all of the media outlets ran with this story, and until the O.J. Simpson case happened, this was the biggest murder trial in the history of the country. This was on every channel. It was on every newspaper. If you went, if you go back and look at footage of the trial, I mean, they broadcast this entire trial on television. So everybody, you know, was there to, was, was there to see word for word what happened in this trial. And it was something like, you know, the likes of the world had never seen before. And many, many, many people close to Pam feel that she did not get a fair trial because again, she was portrayed as this woman that used her sexual charm to manipulate a young man and his friends to go out and kill her husband. Now, the night of the murder, the night of the murder, she was at a school committee meeting and she was away from home. All right. The boys got into her house. They broke into her house. And one of the boys, Billy Flynn, shot her husband point blank in the head with a handgun. And the other three boys that were, with, you know, that were with him, one was the, you know, the getaway driver. The other two ransacked the place and stole money. They literally left Greg's lifeless body on the floor. And what did they do? Did they run home and hide? Did they, you know, panic and tell some friends as to what they did? No, what these boys did, these innocent young boys who were supposedly choir boys in the eyes of the law, what they did was they took the materials they stole from Greg and Pam's house. They drove to the beach. They sold those items at the beach and they bought drugs with the money. Then a week later, these same young men went to a storage facility and they robbed it again to buy drugs. So the media portrayed these young men as these innocent little angels that Pamela manipulated when in fact that was as far away from the truth as you can get. You know, that is not what happened. What happened and what many people close to Pam believe, these three boys had connections to law enforcement in New Hampshire. And these three boys were put in prison together after they were arrested, and they were sharing the same cell and adjoining cells the entire time they were together. Now, who does that? When they were together in this jail cell or in these jail cells, they had time to work on their story. They came up with a story, and at that point, they struck a deal with the police, with the prosecution, so they would not have to serve the rest of their lives in prison for murder. They blamed it, blamed it on Pam. Keep in mind, Pam from day one has said that she had an affair with Billy Flynn. It was the biggest mistake of her life, and she has never denied it, not once. In the same breath, she has now spent 30 years of her life in prison, and she still maintains her innocence when it would have been much, much easier for her to admit guilt and maybe have the state look at her in a favorable way. OK, so she has taken this for 30 years with her, maintaining she was innocent. Now, what happened to the, the three boys, you ask, if you don't know, these three boys are now free. They are free. The gunman and the two people or the three people that went along with him struck deals. The man that put a gun to Greg's head and shot him and killed him is now free from prison. The other three men are all free from prison. The only person that is still in prison and she is going to be there for the rest of her life is Pamela Smart. Now, did she make mistakes? Absolutely. Did she sleep with an underaged young man? Absolutely. Should she have done that? No. But does that mean she should spend 
the her entire life in prison? I don't think so. I don't think so. So we've gotten some new news lately, and I'm going to have Linda Wojcic call in if she is in the studio right now. So Linda, if you're in, please call me. If not, I will text you and uh, get you into the studio to make sure you're in the right place. But what's happened recently? Yes, this is in New Hampshire. So I grew up in New Hampshire, and um, I grew up maybe you know ten minutes away from where Pam grew up. I did not know her. You know, it was a different school district. She was working. I was off in college. So I really didn't even know much about this when it happened. I was away in college and not really paying attention to the news and things like that. But, you know, this was a huge case. This was a huge case. And what is coming up, the news that came up now is huge. And I, I'm looking at my phone right now. I think that Linda might be in the wrong room. So bear with me. I'm going to text her really quickly. Eric, you want to call in for a second? I got to make sure I try to get uh, Linda into the right room here. I think she may be in the wrong place. So hold on. I'm just going to text her. Thank you. All right. All right. I just texted Linda. I think she's having a hard time finding us, but she'll get here. She's done this before with us. So anyway, the news that came out recently is the man that prosecuted the Pam Smart case. He was in Brooklyn, New York, and he ended up he ended up um, trying a case in Brooklyn. He ended up moving to New Hampshire and working in the state of New Hampshire. So this gentleman recently had a murder case, a murder conviction that was you know, somewhat similar to the Pamela Smart case thrown out. This was a guy that spent over 20 years in prison. He was tried by the same lawyer that tried Pamela Smart. And in this particular case, it appears that there was a lot of malfeasance in the way this person conducted himself in the case. So now... Pamela Smart and her family are calling out to the state of New Hampshire. They want the state of the New Hampshire to, again, look into Pamela Smart's case. So Pamela Smart now is kind of still in prison. She's struggling. She's fighting for her life. She is hoping to get fair treatment from the state of New Hampshire. But the state of New Hampshire right now is saying that they do not want to look into this case again. So for me, you know, there was a lot of reasonable doubt. He is. I see Sonia's comment there. Sonia, you're absolutely right. Um, there was a lot of corruption, I think, that's happened in the state of New Hampshire. And it's it's sad because when you look at the way Pamela was portrayed in the media, she was portrayed as this black widow. She took advantage of a young, innocent boy. She manipulated him into killing her husband. And the family tells a very different story. Linda Wojcic is an amazing person. She's a nice woman. I've gotten to know her now over the last two years. And she really is one of the sweetest people that I've ever met. I've read her book about her daughter. And there were so many things about this case that did not make it into trial that should have made it into trial. And it's just very, very unfortunate that the state has not treated her fairly. So we're hoping that Pam or Linda can get in very quickly into the call and hopefully be able to, uh, <laughs> I'm going to have to talk Linda through this really quickly. Hey, Sonia, you want to call in for a minute? Sonia, give me a call. I've got uh, Linda Wojcic is texting me. and She's having a hard time finding it, finding her way in. So I want to be able to text her and it would be nice to have someone to get on and talk to while I do that. But she is in a show from yesterday, so apparently she's a little confused as to, as to where she needs to be. But this is really important for her to get a chance to you know, talk about uh, what's going on in the case and all that, because it really is huge news. So um, hold on one sec. I'm going to play a little bit of music, and I'm going to come back in a second. Let me work with her. Hang in there, and I'm going to get her on. So hold on. Hang in there, everybody. I'm texting her. We'll get her in. Keep in mind, Linda's 78 years old, and sometimes this technology is a little foreign, but we'll get her in here, so bear with me. Hopefully, we'll see her pop in in a second. Sonia would like to call in. Perfect. All right, Sonia, let me turn this music off. Sonia, how are you? Uh, okay. I'm not, not that I want to call in because I want this... Time to be for Mrs. Wojcic, 
Oh, I see I, into I, the live studio. I'm not sure if that's her or not. But we'll see if that's her. If she calls in, we'll know. She was just having a little trouble. I think she was in the wrong room. Yeah. So we'll see if that's her. But no, I agree. I want her to have a ton of time to be able to talk about this. And maybe you, you can talk a little bit about what you know about you know, Pam and Linda while we're waiting for her to come in. What can I say? They're both my favorite people. Pam's mom is like my mother. She has always been there for me. She's been my rock. Pam is a, my best friend. I can't tell you how much I am excited to hear all of this new information that's coming out for people to know this so that we can get her finally out of prison. There's no need to keep her there any longer. And it looks like we have. Her. I think this is her right here. Yes. She is the name Linda. But once you finish your thought, because I agree with you, I've gotten to know Linda over the last year, year and a half, and she is honestly like one of the nicest people I have ever talked to. She's kind. She has a huge heart. Even though she has been through hell and back with her daughter in this situation, I've really never heard her say a, a bad word about anybody. I mean, she's a wonderful person that literally invited me and my family up to her house and she was going to bake his cookies <laughs> for the show and uh, just such a nice nice person so hey linda you found your way in how are you hi too bad i'm a dingbat <laughs> <laughs> we get you know, we I, get to I, laugh I, about me <laughs> I have problem solved I, I don't have anybody helping me so i had to put a little music on while i texted you back and then Sonia <laughs> wanted to help us out so oh, anyway, how, how are nice you, how you doing i'm well how are you john and your family doing very well everybody good Okay, They're doing very good. well. We are. We're doing well. You know, Hi, Sonia. Hi, Mrs. She... Wojcic. How are you? Oh, well, and thank you for all your support, all of you girls. John, they're fabulous. They they're really wonderful. are. They really you know, are. And so are you. Oh, thank, thank you. you. you know, Pam's very lucky to have a good support system. And I got to ask you, before we get started, I'm not going to tell anybody where you are, but I know you're in a warmer climate. How's the weather where you are right now? Sweating bullets. I have shorts and a T-shirt <laughs> on. I'm in the house. The oh. air is on 79 because Johnny's cold when I put it on 78. <laughs> and I know everybody's different, huh? But um, uh -huh. I'm still walking my three miles a day with my friend trying to stay sane and stay healthy and all of that. Yeah, this so, is so uh, hard. With the coronavirus, the it's been terrible. Yeah, we're also Awful. quarantined and separate from everybody. Yeah. And everybody's grouchy. <laughs> well, they are. We're, we're, we're trapped here. We're in this house now. I love my family, but I'm yep. trapped here with my four kids. Three of them are teenagers. My oh wife's trapped my. here, and we're we're all doing school work and trying to do our jobs. And oh my goodness, God help yes, me! Yes, it's <laughs> unbelievable. Yeah, I talked to the New Hampshire uh, former AG, and she was telling me that she's going through boxes because. She had a leak in her house, and she's got all this stuff in the kitchen, and it's a big mess, and she's trying to teach her little one. And I said, same thing here. So I have all Pam's legal documents in, in the garage, and because I was locked down, I made a family collage on one wall. It came out beautiful. <laughs> oh, that must be nice. Hey, if you yeah. get a chance, take a picture of that. I'd like to see that. I'd love okay, to see I'll, that. Okay, I'll send it to you. All right. All right. Listen, I want that, too. Yeah, that'd okay, be nice. Sonia. Good. All right. Hey, so Linda, why don't we get started? And what I wanted to talk about first was what's happening right now. So I'd like to hear in your words, I know that a lot of new developments have come up recently with the attorney that prosecuted this case. A lot of people felt that he was very unfair in the way he tried Pam. So could you tell us what happened in New York, New York and how does that relate to Pam's case? Yes. A... New uh, Brooklyn, New York, Superior, I'm sorry, Supreme Court judge overturned one of Maggiato's cases recently, uh, a man by the name of Mr. Domon, D-O-M-O-N-D, who had spent 29 years in prison for a crime he did not commit. And what happened is that Maggiato withheld information from the jury and he uh, stretched the truth, if you will, and that judge saw fit to overturn, and rightfully so. And so now I would like to say that now that Maggiato's integrity has been impugned, I believe all his cases should be reviewed. Um, he spent, let's see, uh, five years as a DA in Brooklyn, 
and only three years as a, a AG in um, in New Hampshire. Now, New Hampshire didn't have very many murder cases, and I'm told by other people, of course you have to prove this, that his conduct, Maggiato's, was so egregious that they wanted to get rid of him. And they did, and they sent him to a very quiet place in New Hampshire that didn't have a lot of crime. And you know the rest of the story. He was Pam's prosecutor. And I've asked um, the uh, assistant AG named Eric Gonzalez if he would please look at all the cases. Uh, we have a few people asking the same thing. And if any of your wonderful listeners want to ask, then I have the address for the AG, and I also have the New Hampshire AG. Now, what you need to know is Jane Young, who's the assistant AG in New Hampshire, stated in the press it did not impact Pamela Smart's case because when she applied for commutation, quote, they thoroughly researched her case, unquote. Well, guess what? They never gave Pam uh, a hearing, John. So for her to say they researched her case, I find that hard to believe. I mean, she, they didn't even give her a hearing. So that's where we are. We're asking these people to look into more cases. We, quote, I would say, need more ammunition. And that's sad, but it's true. And when I told Pam, she said, you know, Mom, I feel God's hand working in this as I have felt him working in my life throughout this ordeal. Maybe now people will see that I was unlawfully convicted of a crime I never committed. And I'll stop talking. You probably have a question. Oh, no. I mean, you, you can talk as long as you like. You know, you have free, free range here to go is, is, you know, whenever you want. But I guess you know, my, my questions are, at this point, when it's been proven that the prosecuting attorney – was for lack of a better word, dirty. Yep. Why wouldn't the state of New Hampshire choose to look into her case when a very similar case in the state of New York was thrown out because of his behavior? Why wouldn't the state of New Hampshire choose to look into this? I think because they are desperately afraid to admit they made a mistake that would bring lawsuits and everything else. That's what I think. I don't know. I, have, I, I don't understand it. It seems like, oh, they need to be pressured. And we're trying to pressure them into looking. That's not a lot of cases, John. You know, in three years, there was not a lot of murder cases, luckily. So how many could there be, you know? And that's where we are. No, it's true. Because, you know, what I've seen from my perspective is, you know, again, I grew up very close to where you, you all lived in New Hampshire. Right. And I have, you know, posted this on Facebook when I've done the shows and, you know, got a lot of comments, a lot of comments and a lot of the comments were very, very hateful, very, very negative, mean spirited. You know, the people, a lot of the people in New Hampshire just feel that she is exactly where she belongs. A lot of them would come out and say, well, she murdered her husband. She deserves to be there. And I, I would always step in and say at that point, well, you know, just remember, she didn't murder anybody. The young men that broke into her house were the ones that murdered her husband. Uh, Pam did not do that, you know, and the story that they told was something that they contrived together. And in fact, you know, Pamela has maintained from day one that she did not manipulate anyone to do anything. And I, I always look at, you can judge a person's character a lot by the way they handle themselves. And you look at the way Pamela talked about the affair that she had with Bill Flynn. She admitted from day one, it was a mistake. She never came out and said, tried to lie and say it didn't happen. She never came out and said, that, you know, it wasn't a mistake. She said from day one, that was a huge mistake in judgment. But keep in mind, everybody, people need to remember, she was not a 40-year-old woman. She was a 22-year-old woman who Linda has described to me as being emotionally immature at that point when a lot of 22-year-olds are. I know I was at 22 years old. And she was dating someone or started seeing someone that was only a few years younger than she was. Was it wrong? Absolutely. But if you look at me right now, you know, I met my wife when I was 30 years old and she was 22. So I am seven and a half years older than my wife. The age difference between Pamela and Billy Flynn was less than that. Now, again, I get it. It's a whole new avenue when you have someone, an authority figure and then a student. But it just bothers me upside and down that these guys were portrayed as these innocent little angels when they were not. They were not. That was a false narrative. 
that was provided to the state. And these three young, these four young men who most likely had connections with law enforcement in New Hampshire were able to get adjoining jail cells. They were able to come up with an alibi. They struck a deal with the state. They got off. They're all out living their lives right now. So the gunman, the man that shot Greg in the head and killed him, stole his materials, his possessions, and then went to the beach and sold them for drugs, is out yes. free, living his life. And Pamela is spending the rest of her life in prison. Now, let me throw this up before I throw my next question to you. This is one thought that I've had for quite some time. I've thought about this case a lot. And my feeling is, okay, if you're one of those people that is never going to believe Pam, okay, you you think she's guilty, you think that she did it, she manipulated the boys, everything the court said was true. How long is enough for that? The people that killed her husband are out. Okay, they're out. She spent 30 years in prison, and she is going to spend the next 20 or 30 years in prison unless something happens. Now, imagine the other alternative. Imagine if Pam is telling the truth. Okay, we have an attorney now that's dirty. We have an attorney where another case, another murder conviction has been thrown out because he was dirty. This same attorney is the one that tried Pam Smart in New Hampshire. He was moved out of that area. Why? Maybe because he was dirty. I don't know. I can't begin to judge why, but it's just my guess. So imagine if she has spent the last 30 years of her life watching her parents grow older, missing opportunities to have a family after her husband was taken from her, and she has spent all that time in there innocent of this crime. So I guess from my perspective, why not look at it again? If we now have proof that the attorney has done some things he shouldn't have done and a murder conviction was thrown out, this case needs to be looked at. But when I post things in New Hampshire, like I was beginning to say, most of the people in New Hampshire are against her. And the, and what you said, Linda, was right on the mark. We need to pressure the state of New Hampshire because right now there's no reason for these politicians to step in and do the right thing because if they do you know if governor sununu steps in for him it's political suicide to go in and overturn a conviction so i think you're right i think we do need pressure and so if some of the listeners here that listen in the live and then listen afterwards in the published podcast and all the different platforms you know think about getting involved help this woman help her family now linda if you could the, the question i'd like to ask you next is if you could uh, try try to do the best you can in pointing out some of the things that were maybe said in court that weren't necessarily true. Like you told me about the letters you had from the boys. I do. And I also have, I also have a quote that was in the Boston Herald uh, from Raymond Fowler. He's the fourth person. He was an adult at the time. He says right in there and I'm quoting him, Pam Smart never asked me to kill her husband. I went there to rob. I did this on my own. I am. Uh, I took the blame for it because it was my, what I did on my own. It's amazing. Now, remember, we had him on our witness list and the state arrested him and he was no longer a witness. Isn't that interesting? I wanted to say one more thing. Pam Smart's prosecutor, Maggiato, was censured for having sex with a client in 2010. Now, you may say, well, so what? Well, guess what? This is how New Hampshire hides stuff. <laughs> uh, it's in the New Hampshire newspaper. And instead of saying prosecutor censured for sex with client, it says Pam Smart in big, bold headlines, prosecutor censured for sex with client. Now, am I judging him? Yeah, I guess I am because um, this goes against the uh, preamble of what lawyers are held up to. And he admitted it. He had a woman client and he had a sexual affair with her and the husband sued him. Good for him because it was wrong. But guess what New Hampshire did? They gave him a slap on the wrist. That's it. Big deal, huh? Nothing. Terrible. See what they, yeah, awful. Now, why I say that is it goes against his character, doesn't it? We're talking about the same fellow that just had this case overturned. So, I've had people tell me he's a snake, he's this and he's that, but you have to prove it. But this is a true fact that I think people should know. This That's what this man did. Did it make it right? He's the one that shook his finger at my 22-year-old daughter. She made a mistake. It wasn't right. At the time when he did this, he was a married man with nice young men, children, a wife, and he was in his 40s, and he did this? Shame on you. 
Anyway, I guess I oh. forgot what you asked me. Oh, no, no, that was that was perfect. And I don't want to gloss over the fact. The other thing that you said too about Fowler, I mean, yes. Fowler admitting. He yep. admitted in the Boston Globe, the biggest yes. newspaper we have in Boston, he admitted that he was never asked to kill Greg Smart. Right. Do you want me to send you that when we hang I up? Would, I would love to see it. Please send that off. What I do is I take a picture of it on my yep. iPhone, and then I'll send it to you. It may have been the uh, Globe or the Herald. I'm not sure which one, but I have it. I sure hey, do. You're pretty good. You have an iPhone. My father still has a flip phone. He's 80, yeah. so <laughs> oh, um, my son bought it for me he's so funny he wants me to have the best of everything it's like jay i really don't need this you do but i i don't anyway i know the iphone so, having a leash you have them in your hands all the time with all the different things they can do but i mean that, I that is such such an important thing i yes. mean it's a reasonable doubt one of yeah, the here's, four- here's the other thing here's the other thing Sis- yeah. sisty and Toomey, the attorneys it's easy to go back and say oh gosh they didn't do this and they didn't do that but they didn't they never brought up the fellow that said that um they bought bullets from him his name was george eman e-m-o-n-d during the trial um, they said his name, and these people, Flynn, Latimy, Randall, all said that, you know, they broke into a storage bin the night before they killed Greg. How awful is that? Right. They were looking for bullets, but they said they did that. And Sisti and Toomey never called this Eamon guy where they claimed that they bought the bullets from him. That was easy. He was right there in the area. So, I mean, there are so many, so many things. Anyway. <laughs> Let me ask you this. So if, I, I'm sure that Pam has told you the story. You've heard the story from her. What is what what are her feelings as to what happened that night? Like what what in her story is different? I mean, obviously, the boy said that she manipulated them. Does she feel that these guys were just robbing the house for money? Were they out to get Greg? What was their motive for going into that house and eventually shooting Greg? She thinks that um, Flynn was very, very angry. He used to begin to cry when she tried to break it off. And it was a very short period of just two weeks that she was with him. And every time, and she knew it was wrong. And she used to say it to him, you know, I know this is wrong. I'm doing the wrong thing. This is bad. I want to break it up. I'm using my own words. I want to break it off. And he would begin to cry and become very angry. And she was afraid of Flynn at the time. So in her mind, she thinks he was quote, fixing her. Well, you don't want to be with me again. I'm using my own words. Then I'll fix you. I'll, you know, and he didn't tell her what he was going to do, but that's what she thinks he did went into the house to steal and then apparently to kill Greg because they had a gun and bullets and that's what they did do. So well, awful. And tell us so, again, where, so where did they get the gun from? Where did they get the gun from? The gun was from Mr. Latimy. That's Vance Latimy uh, Jr.'s dad and it was stolen and Ralph Welch was a friend of theirs and he heard them discussing it and, and behind a closed bedroom door, the three of them, and he went to the police after that and said, I know what happened. And he was the one that broke all that. And yes, it was Mr. Latimy's gun. And Mr. Latimy went to the police with it and said, you know, I believe this, again, I'm using my own words. I believe this was the murder weapon. And it was. And um, it's, that's what happened. Uh, they did take that gun from Mr. Latimy and uh, they got the bullets from if we're to believe them, from George Eamon, who had a gun shop in, I want to say, Hampton, but I'm not exactly sure, but in the area. And that would have been easy. You know, did they, did he? It's important because it, it all goes to who's lying and who isn't, you know? I mean, what are the facts? Uh, no, I know. I, I know. And you, you're doing a great job. I, I know this is hard for you. And that actually, I went back and forth. I actually asked Pam. No, no, it's okay. It's fine. I asked Pam a few times if I should write to you because I know this has been hard on you. And I figured with these new developments, you know, I figured I would give you, you know, another chance to come on with me so I can publish this in New Hampshire and hopefully get you some help because you, you need it. You deserve it. This has been such a long road for you. And, you know, like everybody else in the very beginning, I was someone that I found the little page on Facebook, you know, uh, free Pam's. Yeah. 
card. It was a private group. And honestly, when I first clicked on it, I was like, oh, this should be interesting. I'll click on this. And boy, Pam Smart was that murderer from New Hampshire. And this will be interesting to see this. So I got in and I probably didn't even make a comment for the first four months I was in that page. I would just read what people said, took it all in. And it was kind of like, you know, being like a you know bird's eye view of what her friends were saying. But the more I listened to people, the more I saw the way they would talk about Pam, the more I heard about Pam, the more I heard about the many, many, many good things she did while in prison, while she's been in prison. I mean, she's been amazing helping people in prison. She's an amazing person. She's done a lot of good things. That's when I finally started to think to myself, I'm like, boy, could they have gotten this wrong? And is this poor woman spent the better part of her life in prison because of basically being framed by these four boys who had connections in New Hampshire and, you know, it, it broke my heart. And I, I've been thinking about this a lot. I saw the comment from Sonia. Let me scroll back up a little bit here. She she reminded everybody to please read Linda's book. It's Linda Woke, <laughs> uh, to live for a mother's cry for justice. And this, you know, we're not saying this to plug a book. We're not saying this to you know, make anybody money. I bought a copy of this book. I read it. It's very, very good. It talks a, lo a lot about many of the things that were missed in this case. And it talks a lot about Pamela, the person. And that's one thing you know, I'd like to have you talk a little bit about. Could you talk a little bit about, you know, what was Pamela like as a little girl? I know she was a cheerleader and okay, maybe, sure. maybe, move, maybe move into, you know, some of the good things she's done while she's been okay. in prison for the last 30 years. Okay, I wanted to tell you one thing. Pam had surgery on Thursday. She's yeah. fine. And Good. she went back to work on Friday. <laughs> Isn't well, that wonderful? Yeah, she and I emailed quite a bit. She emailed me the other day and told me okay. about her surgery. And she told me initially she was like, I think, shaking or whatever. But she, yes. she's better now. Yep. She told me the yep. whole So I'm glad she's yep. doing better from her surgery. That's what a hard worker she is. Yeah. Okay, um, she had four jobs while she was in high school and on the honor roll all four years. She worked at Dairy Queen. She worked at a bakery in Wyndham, telemarketing, and Porky's at the lake where we lived. She also taught uh, CCD, which is religious education, to younger children at St. Matthew's Parish. She also fed and helped the nuns who were quite old in a convent in New Hampshire, the Sisters of Mercy. She liked that very much. And she also was on the school bus with a nice young man who lived in the neighborhood. And sadly, his mom had cancer. And Pam took it upon herself and asked if she could. And they said, sure. She went over there and she stayed with her and she fed her every day after school until she died. And she said, you know, mom, I loved being with her because she was so peaceful, so peaceful. You know, I mean, she did all these nice things and she was part of cheerleaders, as you said, and she got the girls on board to support Save the Children in third world countries. So, you know, I mean, I think those are a few things that, you know, are nice to know. And then when she was in prison after the incarceration, she worked on a mental health unit for three years. And before that, uh, an inmate named Chicky, and I talk about that in the book, took care of her. She taught her to, the lady was older than Pam. She didn't know how to keep herself clean, nor did she know how to keep her cell clean or any of that. And all the other women, not all, but many would take her cigarettes and coerce her into giving them her cigarettes. Chicky, I mean. So Pam asked for permission and received it to keep her cigarettes and give them to her when she asked for one. And then she proceeded to teach Chicky to clean herself and to clean her room and to wash her underwear and to do this, that, and the other. And she did a very good job of it. And she used to, Chicky would call her sis, sis Pam. She even called me mama Linda and my daughter Beth, sis Beth. And she did a good job and Chicky was thriving. Well, Pam was moved to another unit as they often are and Chicky regressed. And Pam felt terrible because the lady had an odor about her and it was not good. All of that returned. So one day there was a lot of excitement on the unit, a lot of yelling. And Pam looked up and there was Chicky screaming, sis, I'm home, sis, I'm home. And she had a little paper bag with her <laughs> with all her worldly belongings. Wow. And Pam then had to start again and she did and she took care of her yeah 
So, I mean, those are nice things. I mean, who does that? Who washes somebody's rear end unless you have to, unless you've been, she wasn't taught how to, you know, do those things as a, as a healthcare professional or whatever, but she just took, took it upon herself. That's who she is. She cares very much about other people and it shows. And, uh, that's how, why, how many people has she helped get their high school degree in oh, prison? Many, many, many. And they write beautiful letters, and they also come to see her, John. They don't forget her. I think I told you last time that one of the girls met a nice young man, an attorney, and they had a baby, and they named her Pamela. <laughs> and they come bring her in there. <laughs> and isn't that nice? I mean, it's amazing. It's beautiful. And yeah, I, don't know, sorry, I, I don't know if you see the chat. You're, you're probably not looking at the chat. There's a gentleman no. in here that's from the Boston area. His screen name is Boss Hog. And he actually mentioned that his sister was in prison with Pam when oh. they were in Boston. And he said that Pamela was one of the most caring people that his sister had ever met. So oh, he kind of mentioned that. So he knows her or his sister knew Pam in prison in New Hampshire. And uh, he just made that comment about what a nice person Pam was in prison and how caring she was. Same person she always was, and that's a wonderful thing. And thank you to that young man. I don't. I'm talking and I'm reading from my notes, and I don't have you lit up, so I guess I don't see who's doing what. A dingbat, like I said. <laughs> I do the same thing. I'm sitting here, you know, I'm an old man with my readers on, trying to manage this technology, <laughs> and I've got my notes to the right and the board to the left, and oh boy, I'll tell you, I'm really one cool. ahead of you, John. I'm 78. I'll be 79 in a week or so, and I have hard contact lenses. <laughs> How old fashioned is that? <laughs> you, you, you do a great job. I don't. I don't think my father would have a prayer of getting onto Podbean like you did. So you <laughs> in the app and get in here and do the things you oh, need. Oh boy, to get in here, which has been great. But if, if you don't mind talking about it, you know, I, I'd like to ask you because actually Pam wrote me an email and I'm going to read her comment off in a little bit as well. Okay. How she feels about what's going on, but um, what I want to what I want to ask you about is if if you don't mind, point out some of the inconsistencies if you could, in the prosecution's case. I remember you mentioning that you had the letters from the boys that they had written Pam. Now, not just um, the, the the Fowler kid who was, who was quoted in the Boston newspaper, but right. the letters you had talked about with me. And okay. what those they, didn't, they did not write to Pam. They wrote to uh, other inmates that had been in there with them. Okay? okay. One of them is Ricky Davis, and he's still in a prison in New Hampshire. And he's a fine young man because he shared those letters and they're pretty powerful. And in one of them, and I'll have to swear, is it all right? Swear away. Go ahead. Oh, okay. I'm going to like that. <laughs> <laughs> Flynn writes um, the quote, the jurors, and he writes, dear Ricky, blah, blah, blah. I'm here and whatever. And he says the jurors, uh, have I've been quote I've been told the jurors have been picked they're nothing but bullshitting assholes unquote then he says the AG quote is afraid I'm going to get up there and say she's innocent it's either her or us yep. ready for that yeah so he yeah. said Flynn right? wrote that <laughs> Flynn wrote that and the then he had that. told Pam I forgot to say this when you asked me about like what was she thinking. He had told Pam that he had a sexual affair before her with, and I'd love to tell you the lady's name, but that's not nice. I'd have to ask her permission. She's called me. She's told me Billy lied, and it's true. She did have a sexual affair. Now, the only thing I can do with that is get a, get a uh, whatever you call it, a, not a petition, not an injunction, a, you know, maybe. an affidavit. Yeah, I could yeah. get an affidavit from her if she would. Because when he told Pam this now, remember, um, it, Maggiato on the witness stand said to Flynn, uh, you were a virgin when you met Pamela Smart, right? And his answer was yes. That's okay. not a lie. But yep. then, right, but he told Pam the woman's name while he was having an affair with Pam. So remember, that was a while ago. And then I've talked to the lady in 2015. I wrote it down in my book when she called me. And again, you know, does that overturn a case because you lied? Probably not. But if you lied once, how many times did you? You know what I mean? Well, that's the it's thing. We, again, we talked about it earlier. You talked about the character of someone, yeah. like the yeah. character number one of the attorney who has already had a murder conviction thrown out in New York. 
He came to New Hampshire, had an affair with a client. There yeah. was a lot of shady things that a lot of people believe were done in the Pamela Smart case. And, you know, again, we're talking character. We're yeah. talking again with Billy Flynn, the character. Yeah. He, he had an affair with another older woman before he was with Pam. You yeah, talk was about- Pam's age at the right. time the lady yeah. was, yeah. Well, you talk, yeah. then you talk about Fowler, who quoted one of the four people that killed Greg, quoted right in the Boston Herald that he never went to that house and was not asked to kill Greg or do anything. By that. Pam. She By never Pam. asked me. And I'm going to mail you that. I just Please wrote do. a note. Send John the collage. Please do. <laughs> and a to note from Fowler and Sonia, too. <laughs> hey, Bots okay. just wrote in the chat. He wants to ask a question. So go ahead. Sure. We'll the question down and we'll, I'll uh, relay that off to Mrs. Wojcic. So what, what other things can you think of? Like it, it, you, you had told me when the boys were put in prison, Yep. They were able. They shared adjoining cells, and they were able no, to communicate. No, 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 no. Wait a minute. Um, excuse me. Um, hang on. Um, Latimy not was in the adjoining cell. He was in the same cell, John, same as cell. Flynn. Same cell. Are you ready for that? Ask any, you know, person in law enforcement. They'll say that's unheard of. I've asked plenty. So he was in the same cell, and that was to get this story straight. And in the down the hall a bit, not far away, was Randall in another cell. And then Fowler was down there, but he says um, through his brother, who I do talk to, Robbie Fowler's a good person, Raymond's mm-hmm. brother. And he always told me, you know, uh, Raymond never went there to murder Greg. He sat in the car with Latimy. He didn't know what they were doing. He thought they were robbing. And he said, I went there to rob. And that's what he does. He wow. already did at the time. Yeah. He said, so I was, a, I was a thief. Brother has said that to you point blank. That oh, he yes. To- many oh. times. Wow. Many, many. He even wrote it to me. You want me to dig that out? And find I would it? love to see it. <laughs> okay. I mean, something Rob's, where. Rob's letter. Talk to, talk to the state of New Hampshire. Not introduce that into evidence when the brother of one of the men that went there to supposedly kill Greg has said point blank. He never went there to kill Greg. Pam never asked him to do it. And he went there just to rob the place. Cause that is what I see in this case is I see that these guys maybe were pissed off. Maybe yep. Flynn was angry at Pam for breaking up with yes. him. And he right. went there to rob the place and ended yeah. up. Killing, and you know, because they were robbers and they had done that many, many times. Um, he, he goes, let's see now. I was reading this the other day. I'm always looking at something. Um, they used Volkswagen automobiles because, quote, they were easier to break into. And they described how they would break into these automobiles and then they would remove the, I want to say, the, like the tape deck or whatever was in them, some kind of a I remember those device. Yep. Okay, yeah. And, and, and he's talking about that uh, in a deposition. And here's another thing. Remember Cecilia Pierce? That's a big uh, one. Yep. Okay, the huge. All right. Let, well, let, me, on, let me let me frame this for everybody that's in here, because keep in mind with the podcast, a lot of times you have some younger people in here that may not be familiar with what happened. Now, for those of you that are familiar with different cases, and I'm sorry for this similarity, but this is the best way I think I can describe it to people. If people remember the OJ case, remember the, the glove? The glove was the big evidence, I think, that got OJ off because he wiggled his fingers and they couldn't get the glove on. With Pamela Smart, the big thing that happened was one of the girls, Cecilia Pierce, wore wires. And there was an interview that people interpreted some different ways, but people felt that Pam was admitting involvement in the case, when in fact what she claims is she knew her lawyer had already told her that Cecilia Pierce would be wearing wires, and she was trying to go along with Cecilia to get more information because she didn't know what was going on in the case. So, And the police she, wouldn't tell her, right? right. And so Cecilia yeah, yeah. would tell her things. Yes. Yeah, tell me about Cecilia, if you could, a little bit. Okay. That, that's the, that was the smoking gun, I think, in the case. Oh, you know? yes, absolutely it was. Well, we had made a request to depose Cecilia Pierce. Do you know what Maggiato said? Oh, well, you know, and I'm using his words, uh, she's a frail 15-year-old, maybe after the holidays. Well, guess what? The holidays came. Sistine Toomey didn't get to, did not get to depose her. And then I find out much, much later on, guess who got to depose her? (laughs) Kazarosian, who was Latimy's attorney. They got to. Martha Martha Kazarosian? Yes. Okay, I remember her. Mr. Haverhill, I know her. Yep. 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 Yeah, they got to depose her. So what's up with that? 
the main witness against my daughter and we did not get to depose her? That's horrific. That's unheard of. That unheard is un of. Yes, it is. I mean, it just... Oh, yeah. I know. I know. You're out of breath and I am too. I know you are. Yeah, she, well, no, no, but I don't mind not answering anybody's questions. Does the gentleman put his question in, John? He did. Yeah, let me let me let me scroll back up and get that for you really quickly. I just scrolled up and then as people chat, it kind of disappears. So let's see. Scrolling up, scrolling up, scrolling up. That's let's nice of, of the lady to say okay. that. Why why didn't they move the trial to somewhere less prejudiced? Thank or you. Prejudiced? Yeah. Okay. Did you know that Pam's Try, uh, Pam's televised trial was the first in the United States of America. And that judge, who was awful, had the gall to say, quote, I don't travel when we asked him to move it, unquote. Well, guess what? Other judges would have taken it. Oh, no, he wanted it. And then when he sentenced her, as you know, to life without the possibility of parole, he said, I hope Clint Eastwood plays me in the movie. Shame on him. Unbelievable. That, yeah. I mean, that was awful, horrible, so insensitive, so everything. And he wouldn't move that trial. And, and uh, he allowed cameras to play in that courtroom. It was noisy. It, you know, they were, it was, it was awful. But like a jerk, I trusted the system. I really did. I trusted it. <laughs> Well, I know people do. I mean, I think yeah. people trust the system until you find out that sometimes the yeah. system doesn't work the way it should. And you have dirty people, unfortunately, in the system, which is uh, apparently yeah. what happened here, it looks like. Well, let, let me ask you from, at this point. So where is Pam now? I mean, this news about Magliotti came out. He had cases thrown out. New Hampshire has already said, no, we don't want to revisit the case. So yeah. where does it leave Pam right now? Uh, well, we can find an ineffective assistance of counsel if we choose to do so um, right now, I'd love them to find some more cases if that were the truth. And I'm, I'm hearing that it is, but again, uh, that's up to the attorney general. His name is Eric uh, Gonzalez. And I give him credit for doing what he did. Um, and would I love him to, you know, review other cases? Absolutely. So um, attorney Kuby, who uh, did worked with the AG Gonzalez for Mr. Domont, you know, John, it took four years. He took Kuby, told Pam, you know, Pam, I got this case in 2016. See how mm -hmm. sad. So every nothing happens fast. Nothing. OK. Oh. I mean, I can attest to that. No, no. But, you know, it. Uh, I, I don't know anymore what to do. I, I just go from mm -hmm. one day to the next. But we could do that. We could do we could hope that they find more cases. Then we could if not, we can file an ineffective assistance of counsel because too many things went wrong. And uh, will New Hampshire accept that? <laughs> You know, I mean, I've lost faith in, in that state. I moved. I told you that. I sold yeah. the house. Yeah. Um, that's what it still we are. sounds like it's an uphill battle then. It sounds like it's still going to be an uphill battle. Despite it does. The news. Yeah. yeah, it does. I mean, we couldn't. I mean, that was a surprise beyond belief. That was, I thought, what a gift. Thank you, Jesus. I pray every night, every day. I go to bed with this. I wake up with it. I don't even finish my prayers sometimes. But in any event... I thought, you know, wow, that sounds hateful, but I'm happy to hear that, that he messed up. I'll tell you, you know, I want to was... throw this in. I'm reading the chat that's going through right now. There's a lot of okay. really positive, a lot of positive comments coming your way. You know, what Boss Hog just wrote, I'm glad to have caught this show. You you do have so many supporters out there. Please stay strong, Mrs. Wojcic. You seem like an amazing woman. I pray for you to get through, to get closure and justice for your daughter. Hashtag free Pam. Elizabeth, you know, I, I trust our justice system as far as I can throw it. I mean, you have a lot of very positive, nice comments coming in. And again, you know, I, I have a small little podcast. I'm not, you know, any big voice, but I, I think that anything we can do to help and, get the word right. out. You know? And you never know who's listening. You never right. know who's watching. Maybe Mr. Gonzalez will hear from somebody. You know, you just don't know. Never know. Um, we don't know. We don't. We should certainly don't. But what I do know is I'm not giving up. I just hope I can live long enough to see her free. And this isn't about uh, rehabilitation uh, in New Hampshire with this sentence. This is a horrific sentence. It's unjust and unfair. And it's about revenge. I've mm -hmm. decided. And also, 
Um, I feel like people love to hate, not everybody, but many, like you said. And you know what, John? They don't even know who they're hating. Isn't that sad? They really don't. And you know what else? They, they're angry at something else. And they lash out at her because it's easy and it's okay and it's it's okay with them in their minds. But they're not really, they don't know her. How can they yeah. hate her? You know what I mean? And well, I what she point. does in there is amazing. But did you know, I told you she's a, a minister now. She's oh, yeah. A, a, tell yeah. About, yeah. Tell everybody about her being a minister. Yeah, I think it's wonderful. She, um. She ministers to women in there, and that's fine. And also some women were coming from St. John University and from, um, I always forget what's wrong with me, huh? Don't get old. So everything hurts. We're in a hurry. <laughs> what don't hurt don't work. <laughs> anyway, from Yale and Princeton. Imagine that. Now, whether they're still going in there, I don't know, but they were, okay? I, ne I needed to ask for that, and I forgot. But in any event, some students were coming in there, and she would be ministering to them. Well, anyway, a nice couple, um, sister and brother uh, from this church in um, Portsmouth, Rhode Island, uh, um, approached her and said, Pam, we, you know, I'm using my own words. They saw what she was doing. They wanted to ask her if she'd be interested in filling out forms and, you know, becoming a minister if she were chosen. So she did all that. And yes, she was chosen and she's an ordained minister. I'll write it on there and I'll send you one of the papers. So you're getting a lot of stuff when I hang up. <laughs> just so, <laughs> That's all right. yeah, That's just good. so you can see it though, you know, um, it's nice. And um, they said because of the COVID, we can't have a, um, a you know, a, a whatever you'd call it, some kind of a service, but we'll have one after the COVID. And so that's a beautiful thing. So she's a, an ordained minister and she has a master's of science and law and a master's in English. And now she's a, a, a doctorate in, in biblical studies. So she's <laughs> Dr. Smart. <laughs> that's a smart. That's perfect. <laughs> Isn't that? I mean, we're laughing because it's it's beautiful, you know. But it's true, and that's who she is. And she continues to help everybody, every day, everywhere in there. And we can all do God's work, no matter where we are, right? Absolutely, and that's that's kind of what I'm trying to do here a little bit. I'm trying. I, there I, you I, are. See, that's what you're doing too. I, yep, I, you I, are. I, I, you know, it was, you know, in the state of New Hampshire, I called a lot of bad names, a lot of negative things were said about me, and that's okay. I, I like it. It isn't okay because well, why are they doing them. that? See what I mean? You well, know, shame on them. They don't know you. Them. I embrace it. So they can do <laughs> all they want. It doesn't, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll take the words. It's okay. But, you know, hopefully, and I want, I want you to think about this for a second. You know, I'm going to read okay. Pam's comment, what she said. And then I want, while I'm reading that, I want you to talk, just think about, if you had a chance to speak to the people of New Hampshire and tell them what they need to know about Pam, take a second to think about that. I'm going to read okay. Pam's comment, and then I want you to speak directly, because even if you switch a couple of people to maybe believing the truth about your daughter, it, it will help a little bit, because I, I know there's a lot of hate in that state towards Pam. So let me read this really quickly. All right. So unfortunately, when I wrote Pam, she she started by saying, I don't have much time because we have to lock down in three minutes. But <laughs> here here is you know what she had to write. And she actually put together a pretty good paragraph in three minutes. So I was kind of impressed. So she said, I am really very sad that the state of New Hampshire attorney general's office has publicly stated that they don't want to reopen all of Matt Maggiotto's cases. They have publicly stated that the New York case has nothing to do with what happened in my case. Again, talking about character, I disagree with that. But this is truly shocking because of the egregious misconduct by the attorney in the Damon case should shock everyone as to who supposedly stands for justice. If the attorney went through such great lengths to ensure that Damon was convicted, God only knows what misconduct he engaged in to ensure my conviction in the biggest case of his life, which it was. In Damon's case, the attorney engaged in repeated misconduct. It was not solely one instance, and that is indicative of a person who surely committed that same behavior repeatedly. If New Hampshire is so sure that no misconduct occurred in my prosecution, then why wouldn't they want to allow an independent party to reexamine it? Damon lost 29 years of his life, wrongfully incarcerated. Nothing could ever rectify that. I have lost 30 years of my life wrongly incarcerated. When will enough be enough? 
So that was Pam's direct statement about what happened. And she had three minutes before she locked down to write that. And I think <laughs> she did a very nice job putting her work <laughs> where they needed to be. So I guess, you know, Linda, if you could talk to the people of New Hampshire, what do you want to tell them about your daughter? Don't be afraid to seek the truth. That's what I'd say. Do not be afraid to seek the truth. Look at all his cases. Review all Maggiato's cases. That's it. What else? And I, I think the people of New Hampshire, too. Now, you know, keep in mind, I, I grew up in a small town in New Hampshire. I spent the first 18 years of my life there. New Hampshire is a beautiful state, and it's got a lot of good people. And I do not regret growing up in the state. It's a great place to grow up. You know, I live in Massachusetts now. And as I say to people, I went over to the dark side by moving to Massachusetts years ago. But remember that even though you may have watched this case on television you may think that you know everything that happened. You don't. You, you need don't. to look deeper. You need to look at some of the things that Linda put in her book, at some of the things that she's talked about today. One of the four men who was at the scene when they killed Greg said, point blank, Pam never asked him to kill her husband. They were there as well. Right. His brother and, told me that too. And the many brother times. confirmed it. I mean, think about that. That yeah. is what the prosecution hung their hats on. And one of the four men that was there that day that killed her husband said that they weren't there to kill him. I mean, that has got to be something that needs to be investigated. So, but remember when you think about Pam smart, think about her family, they're people, they're people. They're not stories. They're not part of a movie. They're not these fake entities that you've seen on television over and over again. Pamela smarts a person. Her mother, Linda Wojcic is a person. They're people. And you have to remember that when you when you start spewing out the venom, I had so many people come on to my, my page and say the murderer is exactly where she belongs. Yeah. Remember, she did not kill anybody. No, nope. she did not kill anybody. Billy Flynn did. Billy yeah. Flynn, the innocent, quote unquote, 16 year old or 15 year old, went in with a gun. Yeah. He shot her husband. He robbed her husband and her went out, sold the materials, bought drugs, was involved in other robberies, was sleeping with other older women. This was not something that was a first time for him. And he, in my opinion, had connections. He got a chance to come up with a story when he was in prison. They struck a deal, a sweetheart deal, and they have, you know, are out of prison. They're free. The, the people that committed this crime are free. And the woman who had an affair with a younger man, is in prison for the rest of her life because she had an affair with a younger man. She has maintained her innocence from day one. In the beginning, if I'm going to be really honest, I didn't believe her. Right. I didn't think there was any merit to this. I didn't think that Pamela Smart deserved to be out of prison. And I want all of you to know, to some of the people in New Hampshire that are going to listen to this when I publish it again, I'm not a sucker. I'm not stupid. You know, I've investigated this, and I've looked at it a lot. And I believe that if anything... We deserve to look at the case again. We need to look at it again. Pamela Smart deserves to have people look at this attorney who has proven that he does not have character. They need to look at, again, the murderers who, who took her husband's life and claimed that they were there to rob, not kill him. That was one of them that said that. And I think we really need to take a look at this case because she has spent 30 years in prison. And honestly, if that was because she had an affair, she made a mistake. I mean, it was it was a stupid mistake, but she wasn't a 45 year old woman. She was a 22 year old girl. She was a 22 year old girl. She was a young woman and she made a mistake. She made a silly mistake. Should it cost her her entire life? Yes, I need to tell you no, something. Too. Go ahead. Fire away. Uh, Article 18 in the New Hampshire Constitution under the criminal code states, and I quote, the true design of all punishment is to rehabilitate, not exterminate mankind, unquote. So if these people with no, you know what, uh, no, whatever, Go ahead. Go ahead, back, say it. backbone falls, <laughs> Ovary, ovaries in my case, <laughs> if they have none of that, all they have to do is look at Article 18 and go by their own New Hampshire Constitution and, and read that. And it's, and it's about revenge, as I say, and not about rehabilitation. I have something very, very important to say, and, this, and, and I will tell you this. We, myself, even Pam, and several other people think that um, Billy Flynn didn't shoot Greg 
We I've think Randall, it, let I've me tell it. you why. Explain it. Why Randall did. Roger Fossum was the medical examiner. Okay, now if you want, I'll send you his picture. And, and it shows him with his right hand and his, and his left hand. And Greg, um, Billy Flynn testified he was standing behind Greg. Well, remember this now. I never fired a firearm. Did you, John? I have, Did yes. I'm a gun owner. Okay. I have fired guns. Okay. All right. I have not. However, picture this. Flynn is standing behind Greg. Poor Greg is on his knees. Randall says he has a knife to Greg's throat, and he's holding his hair so he won't move. Flynn says, now, mind you, this is the biggest thing. Flynn is left-handed, Okay. Roger Fossum, and I'll send you the picture, shows with his right, um, his left hand, the entrance of the bullet in Greg's forehead on the left, on the front of it, and the exit with his right hand by Greg's left ear in the back. Now, are you going to tell me that Flynn could twist his left hand and fire that when I show you that picture, when I send it to you, right, all right? Forget what I'm thinking. This is what the medical examiner, Dr. Roger Fossum, said, quote, standing from behind, he couldn't do it. It would be extraordinarily difficult, unquote. Imagine that. Yeah, being, and nobody being, did anything with it. Being the person that's fired a gun, I couldn't imagine being able to do that at all. I'm going to send you the picture too, yeah. though, so you'll see. And I'll, I'll explain. Right hand is entrance. and Okay. And I guess, you know, I mean, and again, the reason we think that Flynn was like a crybaby. Yes, he was angry. But don't you remember? Maybe you don't. Um, and I'll tell you, I, <laughs> you had a feeling I would, right? Right ahead. I want you to. Get okay. This is, what, this is what uh, Randall said when asked what he wanted to be in life. On the witness stand, under oath, I want to be a paid assassin. Right. Can you believe that? And yeah. Sonia, just put that down in the comments right before you said that. That Pete really? Confed wanted to be a yeah. hitman. You just said that. Yeah, a paid assassin. That's what he said. I wanted it's to be a paid. Yeah. I mean, these are the people we're dealing with. You know, I, oh, it's I'll tell you awful. What, one Do you know how hard it was for me not to go to Maine, being the person that I am? Right. Not with a firearm, none of that. I know better than that. But to 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 face people, yeah, to face people. Somebody lies in my face, I need to look at you and say, wait a minute, I believe you're a liar, and here's why. It's well, you, so you, you, hard. You, now, and you look at, again, you look at the attorney now who had a murder case. Yeah, thrown that's out, yeah. thrown out, And then you look at all these different points that all show reasonable doubt. They yeah. all show reasonable doubt. My opinion is if this were tried today in a court of law, she would not be convicted. She right. would not. And, be and I always hope maybe a juror will listen. Some of them were from, you know, different areas. And I'm thinking, you know, maybe a juror, he or she, some of them are gone, Manal, they're dead. But maybe one of them will hear and get angry and say, well, yeah. wait a minute. I didn't know this. How come someone didn't tell us that, you know, or whatever. And mm -hmm. every time I talk to you, I, I feel like I never shut up. But there's oh. so much stuff, so much, you know, each time. I've thought, I've, thought about, I've, thought about you a lot. I've thought about you a lot. And I think about, again, I know that, you know, you're 78 years old now. You've lived with this for a very long time. And yeah. I imagine that you probably haven't gotten, I know you've been interviewed by, you know, a lot of big names and things like that, but you probably haven't gotten the opportunity to really get on and talk about everything that you want to talk about and get it all out there so people can hear it. And I right. think it's important for people because I, I think that one of the biggest challenges that Pam has is that people see her as a thing, not even a person. And yeah. they have to realize that she's a person. She has a loving mother. She has a loving father. She has loving friends. She has a whole lot of people that talk about what a kind hearted person she is now. And she's always been. Yeah. So to me, when we're talking about character, we talk about the attorney who's had a conviction thrown out. He had an affair with an intern. I mean, from what I've heard, we hear about this one instance where Pam admitted to having an affair with Billy, but if you hear everything else about her life, there was nothing in her life that shows that she's the type of person that would commit a crime or look to have someone killed. She was a hurt young woman when she had that affair. She knew it was wrong. She broke it off. 
in my opinion, the kid decided that he wasn't happy with it. He went in, he did what he did. And, you know, here we are, you know, he's out yep. he's living in Maine with his family and she's in prison for the and rest of the he's married. He's, he's married, married now. Yeah. Do he's you married. want me to read? I don't know how much time you have, oh. but I, I dug you through know, Pam, Pam Whatever, yeah. writes beautiful poetry, beautiful poetry. I don't, but she does. I love you to, want me to read. Okay. Sure. Absolutely. This is called We Rise, R-I-S-E. Sapped of strength many days, degraded in myriad ways, nullified by our crimes, vilified at times, forced to witness brutality, wondering what's reality, stripped of our dignity, losing our femininity, battered by the ram of oppression, yet we rise. Pulled apart by the seams, emptied of dreams, separated from those we love, seeking help from above, putting ink on pages, we cry out from our cages, capturing pain in words, demanding to be heard, damaged but not broken, we rise, unrecognized, victimized, compartmentalized, ostracized, bastardized, characterized, institutionalized, marginalized, defying all odds, we rise. Mm, that's beautiful. I mean, that is really that's, a beautiful poem. That's amazing. And that's something? Wow. Yeah. That is beautiful. I see Sonia's comment. Her character <laughs> never wavered. She is truly the kindest person. Pammy is the sm strongest person I've ever met. And we have someone else that came in and said that was a beautiful poem as well. All right. <laughs> Part of what was in that poem, I have to ask you this, because I think it's important for people to hear this. And I know it's probably hard for you to talk about. You talked about it when we talked the first time. And out of the three interviews, I did, the three shows I did last time, my favorite was when I was with just you, because I really enjoyed talking to you. But I think it's important to hear from Pam's mom. You, can you tell the, the people that are listening about some of the horrible things that have happened to Pam in prison? I mean, you had told me, I think, about she was raped. She was beaten. Could you tell the people hear what she's been through to a point. Yes, she has. Um, uh, like a lot of other people in prison, um, not all the guards, but some of them take advantage of the women. Yes, she was raped in there. And the most awful thing was that she didn't tell anyone uh, or didn't even tell us for a good long time, several months. And when she did, I said to her, in so many words, you know, that's awful and so on. And she described everything. And I said, you know, Pam, you shouldn't allow him to get away with it. And I'll let you make the decision, but I hope you will decide to do something about it and I'll help you. And she did. And just as he was subpoenaed to um, uh, be a witness, he committed suicide. Very telling. Yep. yep. And that tells the whole story right there. He did it. Yeah. He was guilty. There you and go. Now, what, yeah. what happened? What uh, I, th This is something that haunts me a little bit. Well, not, a, not a little bit, a lot. What happened to Pam when she first reported? When she was beaten? No. Reported it? When she reported it. Oh, they it. put her in shoe. You ready for that? Do you know what shoe is? It, I mean, you probably don't. And I, get, I understand that. SHU is called the Secured Housing Unit. Okay. There's a light bulb uh, you put in a cell, you're fed through a slot in the door. You're not allowed to come out. It's horrific. It's, a, it's, it's, it's actually against the law in a lot of states. New York is thinking about, they, they may have already um, you know, decided that it's not only unethical, it's inhumane to be put in there. She was put in there for 70, 70 days. I thought she was gonna die. Seven days. Seventy yeah. days. Because that pig, and that's what he was, uh, did that to her. Okay, and I mean, it's just, there were so many things that went on, but um, she got through that, like everything else. And yeah, that's what happened to her. Another time, you know, women are catty. I don't have to tell you that, probably. So <laughs> um, more, more so than men, they really yeah. are. I can tell you that, but whatever. Yeah. It's, a, it's a failing, but it's okay. Anyway, they sometimes think you said this and she said that, and so on and so forth. So one woman in there thought Pam said something about um, her affection to another lady, these two women. Pam had not said anything. The women had apologized profusely, but not before they jumped on her and beat her 
up and she has a plastic plate in her face. Her, she had a broken nose. I raced down there to see her. It was awful, just awful. And her, she still has pain in her leg. Even though all of that stuff, I feel like I would be so hateful maybe, maybe not, I hope not. And she's not. And she just lets it go by and suffers in silence or tells me about it or whatever. But yeah, that's what they did. They jumped on her, two women, and then some of the others thought it was fun to watch and nobody broke it up and on and on and on. And then finally some guards came, you know, taking their sweet time and didn't hurry. And she ended up in the hospital. Like I said, she had a um, uh, broken eye socket and and they, the broken nose and they put that plate in there so that her eye wouldn't droop. And uh, then uh, she has sciatic pain from being kicked and kicked and kicked. It took a long time for her to get any people to help her, any guards, and or it seemed like a long time, but in any event, that's what she suffered. And that's, yeah, it's just awful. And it's, it's kind of a, a common thing in prisons. And, you know, if I can do anything in this world, it would be to bring her home and to help other people that are in there and help with the conditions that are in there. She has helped with a lot of the conditions that are in there. She's um, been voted again to be the inmate liaison committee president, and she gets all the grievances, and she works with the um, deputy of security and the warden and everybody and when they sit there and they talk. And she's very smart, and <laughs> she really is. And one the warden said to her one day, well, Pam, you know the regulations better than I do. Earlier, when you were talking about, uh, talking about her being Dr. Smart, she mentioned that she graduated with a 4.0. So that's pretty yep. impressive. <laughs> it's amazing. All, every one of those degrees she graduated with a 4.0. Can you believe? And I said, Pam, you're too hard on yourself. Stop it with you looking for A's all the time. It's a, you know, a B's good or whatever. Oh no, yeah. mom. I said, you're something. I don't know how she does it. Yeah. I mean, I have a list of poems that are so beautiful. They're really nice. I mean, she's very gifted. So again, what do you do? Sit back and, you know, curl up and, and do nothing with your life. That's easy to say, right? Or do you just keep going and say, please, God, you know, show us the way. Um, you know, I, did I tell you the story of what I said to a priest? I'm going to swear again. Go ahead. Go for it. <laughs> I think it's funny when you swear, so go ahead. I know you don't normally do it, so it's funny. Go ahead. No, I do it. That's like <laughs> that's how I get my aggression out. <laughs> I I had gone to see this wonderful priest. In fact, he had married Pam and Greg. My sister-in-law was with me, and I went to see him because he had lost his mom, and I wanted to give him a hug and see how he was. Okay, so I did that. And then when we went, we embraced and I said, I'm sorry to hear about your mom and I'm sure you miss her. And his eyes filled up and he said, oh my, I miss her so much. And I said, of course you do. I said, but she'll always be right here with you, motioning to my heart. And he then said to me, now I want to know how you are. And I said, well, father, there better be a heaven because I'm going to be so pissed if I was good for nothing. <laughs> and, with, and without even waiting or hesitating, he said, me too. <laughs> oh, so, and that's it, kiddo. Yeah. Well, I can, I can so, tell you that um, actually I, I get a scroll back up. Boss hog made a really nice comment. I want to read this to you. Okay. Um, Boss hog wrote, I love you, Mrs. Wojcic as a former inmate in Massachusetts state prison. I understand fully. And it makes me sad and angry that she's been treated so badly and that these institutions are unsafe warehouses. So I thought that was a really nice comment. That, he, that is nice. Yeah. yeah. And he's been there and he knows, huh? He knows. Wow. He knows. Yeah. Well, I, and I can, you know, you know, what's interesting too, Okay. And I have these, I won't bother to send you this, but I, I think you believe me by now. I think you kind of know me. I do. And, I do. Yeah, good. Um, two fellows, this is really interesting. Two fellows from, <laughs> one from uh, New Hampshire in the prison heard Flynn say these words. Our attorney said, I have to say, she set this up, Pam set this up or we will spend our life in prison. I'm too young to spend my life in prison, unquote. 
then a fellow that knew this that, person. That's, the gunman. In, that's the gunman that said that, right? The killer. Yes, Flynn. And then uh, the other person was in Florida, of all people. And they contacted me and they told me, and they used those same words. Isn't that interesting that Flynn had said to him, and he was in YDC, that's the youth development, you know, when you go yep. before you go to prison, you, you're too young, so they put you in a youth thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Isn't that interesting that those very words, the same sentence, they don't know each other. <laughs> it's odd, really odd. So I thought, oh, boy, here we go again. You know, this again, you know, two more, just another incident where it's too weird. It is. You, you, well, I, yeah. I thought I remember hearing. Didn't I? Didn't I hear in one of the interviews that one of the boys had connections to law enforcement? I well, Fowler's father was a police officer. I do know that, and he was deceased. Uh, okay, that's, all, that's about all I know, and I don't know anything else about it. He's probably a good man, you know. But Robbie, the brother, he's in touch with me, and he always wishes us well. He always tells me what I just told you about Raymond. And yes, I'll send you that. Yep. was right in the newspaper, you know, I mean, it's interesting. And he never blamed her, but see how cute, see how cunning New Hampshire is. The minute we put him on our witness list. Okay. And they knew what he was saying, because guess what? And you could look it up. They had an old, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, a chat or whatever, uh, mm -hmm. Raymond did and Robbie, the brother, and they were saying all that. She didn't set me up and blah, blah, blah. I'm using my own words. I don't remember everything that was on there. But they, that was out there, okay? And New Hampshire probably didn't like it, of course. So the minute we put him on our witness list to use what we were going to use, they arrested him. Cute, huh? Mm. Yeah. And then they gave him a plea bargain because they scared him. See? Well, let, yeah. let me, I mean, let me, I mean, this, this is just something I'm curious. I mean, why, why would they do this? Why would the state of New Hampshire be so intent on pinning this on Pam? I mean, why, why do you think that happened? I mean, I, I can't even begin to understand why they would do that because there's a lot of evidence. I don't think the state wanted to do that. I think Maggiato did. That's mm -hmm. what I think. And uh, I don't know that they knew of his wrongdoings. Um, I would like to know. They say he was, quote, recruited. I mean, why was he, that's a little odd. Like, why did he go from New York to, to a quiet little New Hampshire? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. You know I just, I'm not speculating. That I, not, not that I know much about being an attorney, but I don't think in general, New York City attorneys are dying to get to New Hampshire. Right. To, See? Yeah, legal yeah. career. It's I'm probably thinking the about. same thing. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yep. Yep. So. That's not a place that you'd wish you will. Yeah. Uh, oh. because you were a big deal there or yeah. you were a big dirty deal and you needed to get the heck out of there. I, I, again, I'm speculating. Yep. I don't know. It's just speculation. But, but I mean, it's, it's something, again, it's something to investigate. You've yeah. got a guy now. I mean, again, if we had done the speculation six months ago, it would be purely speculation, but being yeah. now that we have evidence that he had yeah. a case thrown out because of his indiscretions and his malfeasance, then yeah. I mean, he moved to New Hampshire, and one of the first cases he tried was the Pam Smart case, which, yep. again, is without question the biggest case of his career. And, you know, how could you not want to investigate that to make sure you get it right? I mean, for, for me, I, I don't think I could sleep at night knowing that a woman could be potentially in prison for the rest of her life when she did not commit the crime. That would haunt me forever. It really would as a person. And that's why, I mean, it, it haunts me now to think about it. And I, I don't know, it, it breaks my heart, everything that you and your husband have been through, everything that your family has been through. And I can. And I can, you know what? We're not alone. Remember I, that. I how many know. more Mr. Domons and Pamela Smarts and how many others? Every week, it seems, or every couple of weeks, you see somebody and you don't always hear about them, but then you do. And it's sad. Everyone is awful, terrible. We're going on 31 years come August. Come on. And yes, I, I mean, when is enough enough till she dies in there? Is that it? Well, I can promise you this. This is something I'm going to promise you personally. As long as I'm continuing to do, you know, a podcast or whatever this turns into, then I am going to be an advocate. Any anytime anything new comes up, I will do a show. Whether it's with you, with somebody else, I will continue to use my voice to do whatever I can to help Pam and your family. Hopefully, at least get the look that they deserve again from the state of New Hampshire. So thank um, you so very, very well, much. And you know what, John, it hurts and pains me. And I know you get grief. 
I, I mean, I don't read any of the, I'm just, I have too much going on to be looking at a whole bunch of stuff. But everybody, everybody gets grief that yeah. bothers to care about Pam. And isn't that a sad statement? Think about it. You're yeah. a good person. You're only looking for the truth and you only want justice. And yet you get grief. Why is that? See what I mean about people love to hate and they don't even know who they're hating. I think, in, I think in 2020, the negative, one of the big negatives of social media is that, you know, people who, you know, maybe aren't brave enough to say things in person can feel that they can get away with over social. That's right. They can hide behind their anonymity. No kidding. You know, one time when we had a, my brother used to have a bar in Drake at Mass when this happened and he had a, a, a cookout for Pam and a lot of people came and it was wonderful. And I was so crushed. Again, I should have been happy for all the people that came and I was. However, one man from a Boston paper wrote this. Uh, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Like I was no good too. Okay. <laughs> and I remember writing to him and saying, shame on you. You don't know me. If you met me and disliked me, I wouldn't mind you writing that, but you never even met me. Shame on you for writing. that. And yep. I meant it. That's not right. So that's that's what you get too, and it's not right. So people can hide behind their anonymity, and they do it well, and they love to hate, and that's a sad thing. So let's be glad that we're not haters, yep. and uh, that we only want the truth, and that we're people that, you know, I mean, look at the election, look at all that. I mean, I you, oh, well, I'm, I'm with you. Well, I, I never, ever, ever, ever would have guessed, never, that yep. it would be this close. Never. Never. No. And well, that's, yet, why, that's why people don't like the media. I mean, the people don't yeah. like the media. Anymore. Well, guess what? They're starting what to, to look what yeah. happened to Pam. Pam was yeah. screwed by the media. Your family yes. was screwed by the media. Yes. And they're still telling people what to think every day. Yes. And right. now, and if there's only one lesson to be learned, it's a sad lesson, but people are now saying, you know, now I get it with the media and that's an awful thing. And I don't, I actually don't like it, but it, it, it's opening the eyes of some, of many people. They're saying, wow, you know, I, but does it change things? I don't know. There's, there's still a lot of hate up there. There really isn't all over because they did that to her. They did that to her. The media created that and they made her out. They loved using teacher because if I say to you, the postal worker had an affair or whatever, you'd be like, well, that's not nice or whatever. But when you say teacher, our feelings go up, mine do too, and all of that. And she never was. And they were told over and over and over. They didn't give a damn. They just wanted to sell. Their they wanted ratings. They wanted yes, ratings. They sure did. And they, they got them. Be. And they yeah. still do. Like I say, why does this thing about Maggiato having sex with the client, why does it? Why is the headline Pam Smart Prosecutor? That's so it'll sell. People buy yeah. that. They, they, you know. But again, you know, we do what we can do about everything and just keep plugging along. I don't know what else. I know. Well, you've done, you've done a great job, and I know this has been a long haul for you, advocating for your daughter for the last 30 years. And yeah. – Almost 31 years. And I mean, all you can do is keep doing what you're yep. doing. Yeah, I, I right. hope also you can find a way to have some some enjoyment for yourself also. And you and your husband can enjoy, you know, your time and, you know, where, you, where you're living now. And, and I guess now you, you sold your house in New Hampshire, correct? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Well, I can the people, did I, I ever, know, let you me you tell you. Back in what? the day, we, we had a place at Lake Winnipesaukee. You were right on Winnesquam. I didn't know you were there. Yes. You could Isn't have gotten that something? I earlier. Yeah. Well, when the snow gets too deep up there, I have a spare room here. <laughs> <I'm a different laughs> Let me tell you something funny. This is really, talk about ironies, but it's a good story. The people that came to buy the house are lovely. All right. Now, again, it was a very nice house. John built it 44 years ago. Kids had fun. We had a lot of good times. Time and a place for everything. What do you do? Wait till you're 85 if you're even going to get there and fall down all those three flights of stairs. Right. You know, so anyway, we sold the house, but it was hard to find somebody that wanted to be on an island. We're on an island. It's not far from the mainland, but it's, it's still an island. So were you near the big sandbar? Were you near that? Because I love the sandbar. I used to drive uh, well, we're, yes. We're, uh, no, we're more near the Lord Hampshire house. 
You, oh my you god! The, almost, yeah, right across from them. We almost yeah. bought a place there when that fell through. We ended up at Winnipesaukee, so we tried to buy no. it. a little cabin on the water at the Lord Hampshire. Was that, was that really? Yes. Isn't that wild? Well, yep. let me tell you. Let me tell you oh, what happened. The people yeah. come to buy the house. They're lovely. I won't tell you where they're from because you know I don't want to invade their yeah, privacy. However. They come, they look at the house, and she keeps saying, and I'm a pain in the butt about fussy cleanliness and Johnny, too, and we know it. And she said, oh, my God, what a beautiful, clean house, blah, 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 and all of that. And then I made her blueberry muffins from the wild blueberries, and she was all excited. Okay. Well, I hear five days later about that. They want to buy the house. I'm stunned. I'm thrilled, all of that. I make more muffins. I go to the closing. It's it's in Winham, New Hampshire, where we used to live. Okay. okay. I walk in. I have the Tupperware with, the, and I left all the furniture in the house, pots, pans, dishes, four boats. You got it. Everything. Just bring your linens, everything. You just bring your suitcase. Okay. I go to the closing. This lovely lady begins to sob, and she's hanging on me, sobbing. And I'm thinking, what's the matter? And I say, and I put the muffins down and I'm thinking, oh my, they don't want the house. And she doesn't know how to tell me. I don't know what I'm thinking, right? Mm -hmm. Then she tells me this. I didn't know who you were when I first mm -hmm. met you. I went to gymnastics with Pam. Oh, you're I'm, kidding. No, sir. Wow. And is there anything we can do to help you? We don't believe anything that we've read. And she's sobbing and sobbing, and I'm giving her tissues and helping her blow her nose. And, yeah, imagine that. It's crazy. What a small it, world. Wow. But isn't that nice? I mean, she. so I felt good that they're going to live there, and, you know, they're doing different things to it and, you know, whatever. But isn't that wild? That's yeah. And, and then I told Pam, and she remembered her. She, I said, what was your maiden name? And she told me and so forth. See how strange, but it's nice because I'm happy about it. They're going to have fun there. They're going to like it there. You know, they, I introduce them to my neighbors. They love them. It's all good. So and I'll it's, leave it's, you with that nice story. It's a wonderful story. <laughs> Listen, Linda, I appreciate you coming on again, and I thank you so much. And for the people in New Hampshire, let me just please leave you with this. You know, we've got a lot of evidence that shows that maybe Pamela Smart did not do what all of you think that she did. We're in 2020. You know, the attorney that tried the case, he had a case, a similar case in New York, thrown out for his malfeasance. He left New York for New Hampshire. Why would someone leave New York for New Hampshire? He got to New Hampshire, and the Pam Smart case was without question the biggest case he has ever tried. I mean, that was, again, the big case before the OJ case was the Pamela Smart case. The first case in this country that was everywhere. You couldn't avoid it. And you hear, you've heard stories tonight, again, about one of the four men that went into the house to kill Greg Smart that night. One of them, Fowler, Billy Fowler, said point blank that he was never asked to kill Greg. Rob, I Rob, mean, Fowler, uh, Rob Fowler. Wait a minute. Rob is the brother. Raymond is the, Raymond. Is the one. Raymond. Right. Yep. Thank yes, you. Ray, Raymond Fowler said that he was never asked to kill Pam. Yep. He was one of the guys that was in there. That, you know, he was in the car. He was right. in the car with Latimer, the guy yep. that got his father's gun. The only two in the house were Randall and Flynn. Randall and, and Flynn. Uh, we still don't know because um, Randall was the mean one. And that's why we think the way we think. And I will send you all those pictures. And stuff. So I'll, I'll send them on a text. Is that okay? Yeah. Absolutely. Send it. Send okay. it. Via text. I'd love to see it. And if it's okay with you, I might post some of those things for people to sure. see. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, you can. Good. You can post anything I send you. It's all the truth. All and right. yes. And I thank you, Amy and John. You're a good, good person to care thank about you. us and all the other people and that sad stuff in Missouri. Oh my. I know. Isn't that? I mean. And there's a big rally going on right now. Yes. In Missouri. Isn't that good. Yep. Yeah, it looks like they're, they're going to hopefully close down the Agape boarding school. Oh, and apparently, I don't, know, I don't know if you knew this, if you heard the show, but Dateline NBC is there this weekend investigating. Oh, good. Story. Yep. So uh, it looks like we may and get some justice there. Good. And yep. I heard you talking about going to a school, a private yeah. school. Let me tell you about me if you if you have another Ooh, minute or no. Yeah. Do you? Right. Go ahead. Sure. <laughs> It's another funny story. See how I have to let find stuff to laugh about, but it's all true. I went to this um, 
Catholic school and uh, grammar school, and we used to walk home for lunch. It was right around the corner and whatever. Okay. So my mom, before people had backpacks, my mother was a beautiful seamstress. I didn't inherit that beautiful quality. I'm limited to rip crotches and seams. <laughs> but anyway, she made for us five girls and my brother, one boy. Um, we had uniforms and we had like collars like the nuns had. They always had ring, red ring around your neck and your wrists. I mean, it was awful. But anyway, mm -hmm. that's what we had to wear. Okay. So every day I would come home and she would, and I speak fluent French. It was a French school. So she would say in French, why do you have that big rock in your a big stone? And I did in that backpack. And I would cry and I wouldn't tell her why. Well, a couple of days went by and threatened with punishment. I finally told her and I said, you know, that nun with the mustache, if she hits me, I'm going to hit her with this. They used to say, <laughs> that is too funny. Because they, 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 they used to hit the boys and I, oh. I was afraid of them, right? So uh, I finally told her and she marched me. She went to get the priest and she marched me to the school and oh, I was petrified and I'll never, never, I was in the sixth grade, I'll never forget the kids standing behind me saying when she said in French, um, did, um, did, uh, was Linda right? Does the, the sister Celestine hit, hit the boys, whatever? And they all said, oh yes, Mrs. LaRich, she's right. I'll <laughs> never forget that. But the bottom line is, and now, I'm the the uh, nun with the mustache. <laughs> <laughs> Funny how things come around, isn't it? And you now yep. you you probably know. You heard me talking about my school. I won't yep. mention the name of the school, but you probably know what school it is. I went to high school in Lawrence, Massachusetts. Okay, okay. so did my nephew. My nephew okay. went there, Larich. Yep. It's a well-known school, and I saw something yep. very unfortunate happen there back in the day. So awful, yeah. Quite a bit. So it's a hell of a world, isn't it? But we have to find good people, and we have to gravitate to the good stuff. And sometimes it's difficult to wade through this hateful stuff that we're involved in. Not everybody, but and again, you know, God doesn't give us more than we can handle. Supposedly, I keep telling them this is damn heavy. He's giving you off. a full plate. He's giving you a yeah. full plate. I'd say. <laughs> And this is going to be published out to all the platforms. People in New Hampshire will have a chance to listen to it. And if okay. I can leave this with one thing for the people in New Hampshire, remember Pamela Smart's a person. Linda Wojcic is a person. You know, I know the Smart families were people as well. And just remember, you know, Pam was a victim also where her, her husband was killed. She didn't ask for her husband to be killed, and she also lost her husband. Right. So just try to have some, you know, an open mind when you listen to this show and look at some of the facts. Learn some more about the case before you just shut that book and make your decision because there's a lot more gray area that you don't know. So, yeah. Linda, thank you for joining. Well, be, thank you very, very much, John, and anyone else that bothered to write in. And I thank you and Boss Hog, that fellow. Thank you very much. And Sonia. And if I'm saying his name right, hope so. Yeah, you did, you did well. So happy Boss Hog, yep. Yeah. I'll look for all the things you're going to send me. I'm going to put those up on social media. Good, and I'm sure and talk soon. Happy Thanksgiving and boxed in as we are. <laughs> <laughs> all right, okay. Thanks again. All right. Be well, John. Bye-bye. Yeah.